Good evening. My name is Lisa Salisbury, and I'm honored to serve as the 13th director of the University of Idaho Women's Center. This year, the Women's Center is celebrating our 50th anniversary, and the keynote address tonight is the signature event for a year-long series of celebrations that we have planned for you all. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the generosity of many friends and donors who made this event possible. The following individuals and groups contributed $250 or more to supporting our 50th anniversary celebrations. The University of Idaho College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences, the College of Natural Resources, the U of I Libraries, the College of Art and Architecture, the College of Graduate Studies, the College of Science, University Advancement, the Department of History, the Africana Studies Program, the Washington State University Women's Center, Moscow Food Co-op's Change for Good Program, Just Trade, Kay Keskinen, Tom and Tita Reveille, Steve and Diane Daly Larson, Bobby Hughes, Jane Pritchett, jo Joellen Force, Heather Shea, Katie Noble, Carrie Galloway and Paul Stern, Bruce Pittman, Shauna Corey, Jeannie Harvey, Charlene and Dan Ewart, Kent Nelson, Lisa and Tom Salisbury, Nicole Lichtenberg, Rachel Norris, and Sarah Nelson. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. I just, I also want to express my sincere gratitude for the contributions of hundreds and hundreds of other individual donors whose names are too numerous to list. So the University of Idaho Women's Center is one of the longest running, continuously operating campus-based women's centers in the nation. <laughs> Thank you. Now, this in itself is an achievement to be proud of, but in a state like Idaho, where the basic rights and autonomy of women continue to be under siege, it is nothing short of a miracle. <laughs> the center opened its doors in November 1972 in response to the hostile climate and grim statistics for women's success at the university. A small but brave group of faculty and staff fought tirelessly at significant personal and professional risk to bring issues of gender inequality to the attention of the administration and push them to take action. In 1973, the Women's Core Caucus, as this group became known, filed a gender equity complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the Idaho Human Rights Commission resulting in the signing in May 1974 of the Conciliation Agreement, which was the document that brought the Women's Center into formal, and by that I mean funded, existence at the university. So thanks to the dedication and perseverance of each of the 13 directors and the professional and student staff that the center has been fortunate enough to have since its founding, the Women's Center is now a vibrant source of support and connection for the Vandal family and our community at large. We've expanded our mission to serve everyone, regardless of gender or any other identity. Our work has long been guided by a commitment to and a passion for safety and inclusion, and for working collaboratively to engage our community in meaning, meaningful and transformational social change. And yet, the challenges to making our space truly safe and inclusive of everyone are many, as has been all too evident in recent years. These challenges are deeply embedded into our organization, the institution, the state, and in society as a whole. And they're going to take purposeful, long-term efforts to dismantle. Tonight's keynote speaker has made a career of speaking to these challenges with deep insight and profound courage. And I am beyond grateful that she continues to lift her voice powerfully, unapologetically, and truthfully. And I'm grateful that you all came tonight to hear what she has to say. 
Before we introduce our speaker for this evening, I'd like to invite my colleague Sadell Samuels, the director of the University of Idaho's Native American Student Center and a member of the Nez Perce tribe to the stage so that we may honor and acknowledge her ancestors and her community upon whose homelands we are gathered here tonight. Good evening. It is a privilege to welcome such an honored guest tonight. The University of Idaho, Moscow, is located on the homelands of the Nemipu, Palouse, and Coeur d'Alene tribes. We, the indigenous people of this land, have called it home since time immemorial. The University of Idaho gives gratitude for this partnership, recognizing that it is our academic responsibility to build relationships and honor tribal voices. Katsiaoyo. Thank you, Sadal. I'm honored to be your colleague and your friend. Following the keynote address, there will be an opportunity for Q&A from the audience. If you have a question for Ijoma, please navigate to slido.com on your phone and type in the participant code Oluo Q and A. And that should be on the slide above me or coming soon. Um, you can submit your question at any time during the event. Questions will be asked in the order they are received. Please note we may not have time for all of the questions that are submitted. And then following the Q&A, Ijoma will be signing books at the table behind us on the arena's main floor. Um, there are volunteers to direct anyone who wants to come down and get their book signed. And if you don't have a book, we have book people of Moscow selling copies of um, Ijoma's book on the top concourse there. So it's now my pleasure to introduce an extraordinary University of Idaho student, KT Turner. KT and I have known, and oh, yeah, let's, let's clap, absolutely. <laughs> KT and I have known and worked with each other for several years, and she is making her mark on this campus. Originally from southeastern Louisiana, KT came to Moscow in 2019 to pursue her Master of Fine Arts in theater, which she earned this past spring. KT, yeah. <laughs> KT is now a first year doctoral fellow studying history here at the University of Idaho, and her research examines identity, theater, and culture. She is working closely with the Women's Center this year as our 50th anniversary graduate intern. KT also serves on the executive board of the Black Student Union and is the student outreach coordinator for the Office of Multicultural Affairs. Outside of the university, KT enjoys writing, serving her church, watching Lord of the Rings, and caring for her succulents. <laughs> She's active in the community, working with the City of Moscow's Human Rights Commission on our annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration, and with Haunted Lodge LLC. So please help me welcome KT Turner to introduce our keynote speaker. Well, that was fun. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. It is an honor to introduce you all to Ijeoma Oluo. Earlier today, I had the fortune to join some other students during a meet and greet session with her. While chatting with these students, I heard them describe her as accessible and brilliant. But to that, I would add generous, bold, and inspirational. For those of you who weren't there, here's what you need to know. Ijeoma Oluo is a writer, speaker, and internet yeller. She is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, So You Want to Talk About Race, and most recently, Mediocre, The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America. Her work on race has been featured in The Guardian, The New York Times, and The Washington Post, among many other publications. She was named 
to the 2021 Time 100 Next List and has twice been named to the Root 100. She received the 2018 Feminist Humanist Award and the 2020 Harvard hum Humanist of the Year Award from the American Humanist Association. Oluo lives in Seattle, Washington, and we are thrilled and honored to welcome her to the University of Idaho tonight. So please give it up for Ijioma Oluo. Wow, um, this, is, this is really lovely to see so many faces out here. After many years of just hoping people were understanding me via Zoom or whatever hellish technology people decided to use other than Zoom, you're hearing me, Microsoft Teams, nobody likes that. <laughs> it's really nice to be able to connect with people. And connection is definitely something we need right now, in whatever way we can create it. And a lot of times people think of my work surface level as divisive. And that is on purpose. We talk about issues like this as being divisive on purpose, that narrative is built purposefully to stop us from engaging more deeply with what has actually already divided us. People will act like naming a division is the division. But there's no way we can actually come together if we don't talk about what is keeping us apart. And so I encourage you today in this discussion and in all of your discussions going forward to run towards discussion on things that may be uncomfortable, on things that may shed light on what is separating you from your neighbors. And so in this discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about intersectionality. And I think about intersectionality all of the time, but especially when I am on a college campus because that's where I first heard the term many years ago. I was taking a class on women, race, and politics at Western Washington University with Dr. Vicki Shui. I was the only black woman in that class. I was the only black woman in every class I was in except for one, I believe, in the entire time I was on campus. And Dr. Shui is one of the very few still women of color who are tenured professors in that campus. And as we were reading the work of Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw on intersectionality, I was suddenly given language to understand my experience on that very campus and even in that classroom. That is important, first and foremost, because one of the most valuable tools of oppression is to deny us the language with which to describe it. And that is why you will often see attacks on words. That's often why you will hear people roll their eyes at a term like intersectionality or a term like privilege because naming the thing is powerful. Intersectionality has been a cornerstone of my work as a writer, a speaker, an abolitionist. And when I was in college, you pretty much only learned that term if you were taking a class like women like gender, race, and politics, right? Otherwise, it was not discussed. But nowadays, the internet is a much more robust thing, right? You know, if, to, to age me a bit, my Facebook account had to have my college ID 
in order to sign in because it was only a college chat platform at the time. And now it's everywhere. It's a term that people are using in just about everything. But especially in this internet age, I found that you can throw a lot of words around without actually knowing what they mean. You can have whole fights about words without knowing what they mean. Critical race theory, anybody? <laughs> and so let me be clear here for the rest of my talk on what intersectionality is. Intersectionality was a term coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw in the 80s to describe a pattern she was seeing in various efforts to address issues facing women. And the pattern she was seeing was that these efforts often neglected to take into account the ways in which oppression differs for black and Hispanic women. And the ways in which often those solutions then, where they didn't neglect black and Hispanic women, harmed them. And so intersectionality was the term she came up with to describe the intersections of oppression that create unique experiences that we must be aware of if we are to solve these societal ills in a way that doesn't harm others or create new hierarchies of oppression. And it's important to understand this because Dr. Crenshaw did not intend for this term to be a thing that would win you an argument on Twitter, right? She wanted this to be a practice that you adopt so that the work you do is better. Work being the underlying term. And it is really important because this means that in women's spaces, in feminist spaces, in anti-patriarchal spaces, we must be aware of the impact of where we have failed to be truly intersectional. And we must be aware of the risk if we continue to do so. We must know what we are and are not doing, who we are and are not listening to, and who is centered and who is not in the work that we do. This is important whether you believe in intersectionality or not. And there is, for some wild reason, a really strong anti-intersectionality group. And I, I'm saying for a wild reason, they know what the reason is. And there's a few people in here who know what the reason is too. Whether you believe in it or not, you better. Because there's one thing I want to make really clear. There is no women's liberation without black liberation. There is no women's liberation without indigenous liberation and sovereignty. There is no women's liberation without disabled liberation. And while we suffer most when women with racial privilege refuse to acknowledge this, everyone in this space will suffer as well until we recognize that fundamental truth. The same power that oppresses me oppresses everyone here. And it is flexible and it is creative and it has infinite resources. And where you allow it to sit safely, it will grow. And it will always come back around to you. No one in this room is beloved by white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. No one. You may feel safe right now because its eye is not on you, but it will be. You're on the list. You're just a little further down. 
If you are a white woman who is justifiably upset, scared, outraged at the recent violent assault on the right to access reproductive health care, or to even freely speak on reproductive health care, please at least do me the courtesy of not acting surprised. Because every bit of hate-filled, oppressive, violently patriarchal legislation that has passed these last few years has been thoroughly tested for tolerance first. What do I mean by that? I mean that for decades, if not centuries, that Native women's babies have been stolen from their mother's arms by child services and other government agencies, they were testing for tolerance. I mean that when women of color were forcibly sterilized in US prisons up until the 80s and early 90s, they were testing for tolerance. I mean that when disabled people have been sterilized or denied the right to raise their children, they were testing for tolerance. When trans people were denied the right to participate in sports or even use a bathroom safely, they were testing for tolerance. They were testing to see how much autonomy over our bodies could be taken from us. And they tested it every step on those deemed less than, on those made invisible, and with every step, they got closer to the reality we are in today. The consequences of where we are now will be deadly for so many women and queer and trans and non-binary people. But it won't be equally so. And unfortunately, those who have been ringing the alarm bells the longest and loudest while others have preferred to wait until the danger is at their door will face the worst. But don't get it twisted. They are still testing us for tolerance. When university faculty and staff are being told not to educate or advise about reproductive health care or provide contraception to students, you are being tested for tolerance because they are not done yet. And they won't be done until they can roll back every right of every woman, every person of color, every queer and trans person, every disabled person, every poor and working class person, until they are sure that none of us are a threat to white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. So the question is, will you pass or fail this test? Will you rise up and say no more? Will you flex the collective power that they so fear you have? Or will you decide that this too can be tolerated? Understand that all of these recent assaults on our rights come from fear. Hatred is just what fear looks like on defense. It is important to understand that our power is feared. Our freedom is feared. Our growth and our potential is feared. They know what we can be even while they try to convince us we never can. Understand the power that has brought us to this point that we are so feared that whole new laws have to be written to try to hold us back. We are so feared 
that right now stories are being created about the danger of our freedom. Lean into the power of that. Because the truth is, they have every right to be fearful. What we represent is powerful. What we represent is world changing. What we represent threatens power. When we are free, the systems we have in place can no longer stand. When we are free, our power will no longer be defined by how much more we have than others. When we are free, we will not be able to be exploited by the promise of gain at someone else's expense. There is power in that immense power, power that does not require someone else's subjugation. And those who pull their power from systems of oppression have every reason and right to be afraid. And so I ask that we don't negotiate with that, that we spend less time saying, you don't have anything to be afraid of, and spend more time saying, Perhaps you need to figure out what side you're on because this train is coming and you can't stop it. So we must decide that we're going to fight and we're going to fight together. And this isn't some moment where I ask us to set aside our differences and come together. This is a moment where I ask us to dig into our differences so we can come together. We must be able to do multiple things at once. We must be able to look at the danger that's coming at us and the danger that is within us. While we are fighting, while we are taking truth to power, we must also learn how to be accountable to each other. And this means that so many spaces that have said they're doing revolutionary work while prioritizing the privileged few within must do some real reflection, must do some real listening, must practice some humility and find out what it means to heal so that we truly can come together and be that force that has been so long feared. If we do this work, this means that our revolutionary spaces will be actually revolutionary and they will look different. They will center those who have long been ignored and yet have been doing so much of the heavy lifting for so long. They will appreciate and compensate the efforts of those who we've long expected to labor on our behalf for free. When every member of this space can change the space they're in, we'll know we're getting there. And this is something that I know we can do. I am a realist. I am not a pessimist. I'm not an optimist. But I wouldn't do this work if I didn't believe we could do it. And let me tell you why I believe we can. I think I'm pretty dope. <laughs> I think I'm pretty great. I'm a black woman. Pretty damn amazing. And you know what? I don't think the people trying to keep me down are. <laughs> and 
And I think if we recognize that, that we have what it takes, that these horrific systems were not built by people any better, any smarter than us, we can build something amazing. And I hope that these conversations are the beginning of you picturing a world in your image, a world that is free. And I don't know what freedom looks like. I only know when I'm headed in that direction. And I know that that direction starts with us listening to the people who have been asking us to pay attention for a very long time and asking, how can we help? What can we do to facilitate the work that you've been trying to do so long without resources? Where we do that work, worlds will change. I am so thankful that there is a women's center on this campus. I will end my talk by saying that as a young mother in college, women's centers meant a lot to me. They provided the care I needed. They helped me stay in school and listen to myself at a time when many people were dismissing me. And I want that to be the case for everyone who walks through these doors for a very long time. And I know that we can do that. And so I hope one day, if you all ever have me back, that I get to hear about what you've been working on, the revolutionary work that you've been doing on this campus and in this community. Because if, like me, you believe that Black Lives Matter, you believe in the fundamental, irrevocable value of human beings, then you understand how vital every single victory is. No town is too small. No win is too small for it to not count. And yet, it's also not going to be enough and so we keep going and we keep fighting and we celebrate every victory. And we may not see what victory looks like, but we will know when we are in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ijoma. Your words are a gift to our community. We're so grateful that you're here. We're now going to take questions from the audience. So if you have a question that you'd like me to ask Ijoma, please send it to um, slido.com. The participant code is Aluo q and a And my colleague Gina and I will be receiving the questions probably combining a few that are similar. We'll get to as many questions as we have time for. Please note we may not have time for all of them, but we'll get through as many as we can. All right. OK. All right, so Gina's, Gina's going to read the question. Hi, y'all. Um, so I have a couple questions here that I want to throw together, because they're asking very much similar things. Um, they say things like, what advice do you have for black students who feel stuck inside of a conservative state? What advice do you have for um, people of color being in a predominantly white institution and getting through their college years? Um, that's a great question. And I would say, 
there's a couple of things. One, you're gonna have to try to build little pockets of safety that'll get you through. You have to know like what your community is, build resources, lean in to people who say that they really care about these issues. And it's also important to recognize on college campuses that those signs in this classroom, Black Lives Matter and blah, 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 those actually have an obligation for action. And you have the right to actually expect that faculty and staff to support you. And I'd say start calling on that. Um, but then I would also say it's really, really important if you're a student. I was talking about this earlier in the meet and greet. Prioritize the education you need for your life out in the world. And that means you're going to have to supplement a lot of your education, unfortunately. And also resist the urge to be given an unpaid professorship in your classrooms by teachers and staff. Because you can't be educating your teacher and learning at the same time. And if you find repeatedly that people are talking about something and it gets towards race and everyone's staring at you, like you're gonna be that supplement, you're not getting the education you're paying for. And it's important to call that what it is. Because I guarantee you this, you're not changing your professors when you answer that question for them. You go back into that class next semester, they're gonna be teaching it the exact same way they were before. So prioritize your own education. Build safe spaces. If you are a quote unquote ally to people in colleges and towns, one of your top priorities should be to help facilitate resources for those spaces and to protect those spaces. A lot of times people want to be in those spaces and then it stops being that space. Protect it. Protect the ability for black students, indigenous students, for Latin students to come together safely. And always have a group of people that you can kind of level set against. I live in Seattle. Seattle has a few more black people, but not a lot. And it is vital for me to always have like a group that I can come to and be like, yo, am I tripping or is this messed up, right? And I was gonna be like, yeah, no, you're not tripping. This is messed up. Because otherwise, being surrounded by whiteness will have me thinking that I'm not experiencing reality. And you have to always have people that can tell you that you haven't lost it, that what's happening to you is real, and you absolutely have the right to be feeling the way you feel about it. And even though that doesn't necessarily solve the problem, it prevents a whole nother one from adding on to it, which is the, the real psychic harm of gaslighting that black, indigenous, and other people of color go through in this country. Um, but then also just remember it's a wide world. And whatever time you're in, there are other spaces. And luckily we can connect outside of the immediate space we're in, whether that's the internet or travel, depending on what your access is. And please lean into that to get by. Thank you so much, Ijoma. So we have a question here. What advice do you have for future teachers of color on advocating for tolerance and culturally responsive teaching? Oh, um, well, I would say this, this, of course, varies on what age level you're planning on teaching. Um, but if you're teaching, let's say, K through 12, it's really, really important that you build relationships with parents of color and families of color. Um, because the battles that you're fighting at your school and your administration are similar to the battles that parents are fighting. And oftentimes your administrators will try to tell you that what you're experiencing isn't happening. At the same time, they're telling 
parents of color that what their kid is experiencing isn't happening. And until you can connect the two, they're gonna keep playing you like that. Um, build networks. I recommend any person of color going into any field whatsoever. Try to find groups of people of color, whether that's online or in person, in your profession or field, um, to talk with so that you can discuss strategies. And then I would say also, it's really important for me, I always like to tell educators especially, there are people behind the data. There's so much data talking about why we need to have culturally competent, responsive, anti-racist education in our schools for students of all races and ethnicities. There's plenty of data that shows what happens when we don't. It shows how students of color fare. But when we're talking about the data, what we often don't talk about as we're being brushed off is the racist choice being made when that's brushed off. If you're presenting data that says that black students on your campus are 30% less likely to graduate and that gets brushed off, the racist assumption then is that black students are 30% less motivated to finish school. And so I always say, offer that up. Say, hey, we have two options here. Either we're doing something wrong or black students don't want to learn. Which one do you want to sign your name to? And we have to keep being really clear and not letting people skirt around the edges and not say the thing that they're thinking. If they say, oh yeah, I don't think they're trying hard, at least you know, you know what you're dealing with and you know who not to go to. But a lot of times people don't want to investigate themselves why that data point is uncomfortable to them, why they don't want to engage with it. And you just got to say it. And yeah, it'll upset people, but maybe they'll go along with it, if anything, just not to have that conversation with you again. And I'm totally fine with annoying people in the social change. Like, that's fine with me, so long as it gets done. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, someone wants to know, was it intimidating to come to Idaho to speak about racism? <laughs> um, to be really honest, you know, if you're black and you grew up in the, in the Pacific Northwest, Idaho is a scary place, especially if you grew up in my time. Right? We hear the stories. Um, and that's not a fear that has lightened over the years. I just, you know, my last book, I spent a lot of time digging into white nationalist groups that reside in eastern Washington, Idaho, Montana, Oregon. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. But the truth is, uh, there's not a safe place for me in this country, you know? I could be driving in Seattle and get pulled over, and that could be the end of my story. Um, so if I start making decisions on what I'm gonna do, Based on that, I might as well stop doing this work, you know? It shouldn't be like that. This is a beautiful area. Every time I've driven through Idaho, I've thought, oh, I wish I could feel safe here. Because it's some of the most gorgeous area in the country, if not the world. But I say that a lot of places I go. And I think it is important if you move with ease through this space to be aware that that's your privilege and that this space was designed for you and then ask, so what else is happening in my name? Um, and see what you can do to change it so that maybe I don't feel so nervous. Thank you, that's an important, important challenge to issue. I appreciate that. So what advice do you have for white allies, particularly in a state that is trending further and further right? <laughs> um, there's a couple of things I would say. One is you gotta start talking about whiteness and like what whiteness is and how it functions. Whiteness is a structure. It is a culture. It is a political entity. It is a power. And start talking about what it does, because you're a part of it if you're white. You can't do this whole, oh, white people, am I right? I can't stand them. You are them. <laughs> you know? 
and start, if you, if you can't stand it, change it. You know, Dr. King said to paraphrase, paraphrase that white supremacy is going to continue to exist as long as it's tenable to whiteness. And the only way this really gets changed is if white people start making white supremacy uncomfortable. And that means you've got to start having those conversations, be willing to make it uncomfortable. Here's, here's the thing people don't want to admit. White supremacy is in itself a pessimism about the ability for white people to grow and change. At its heart is the thought that any sort of reflection or growth or atonement will kill you. It won't. You're made of stronger stuff than that. <laughs> and the only way you find that out is by sitting in that discomfort and trying to learn a thing and finding out you can grow. That's one of the best ways to create change is by simply saying this is no longer acceptable and watching people have their little toddler fit and then realize they're still here and still breathing and they can adjust. And then in a few years, they're the, that like insufferable person who's acting like they always got it. We can do that and so just be that person. A lot of times what happens with allies is they want to, there is an envy for what we build. There is an envy for the strong identity that comes from resistance that we have. And so instead of saying, what if we actually took a good look at whiteness and what that identity actually is and change it to something we want to actively own, it says, what if I just hung out with you all the time? What if I followed you around? and call that allyship. And that's just annoying, it's not allyship. <laughs> and instead, start taking a real look at whiteness and saying, you know what, even if there's not a single black person in this town or a single person of color in this town, I still want this town to be better, to be a better example of whiteness. I would like it if someone passing through felt safe and welcome, thought they might want to stay a while, right? What do we need to do to make sure that happens? And that work you can do informed by the scholarship and the conversations that people of color in the space have had to help shine a light on what you may not see yet. But it doesn't actually, it's not actually work that like I can do for you. Like that, that's, that's work that's in your house, that's cleaning your own house. All right, I have someone who wants to know what your reaction was when you heard you were a number one bestseller. How did you find out? Oh, <laughs> that's a, I was, <laughs> I was really upset. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was really upset. Um, the circumstances around it sucked. It was um, June 2020. And, uh, no black person wants to be a bestseller because black people are being murdered in the street. Like that was, I was livid. Um, and, and I remember like, you know, like my agent immediately called my publisher and you know, all these white people in publishing and said, please do not call. Please do not send anything. Give, give Ijoma space. And all of my peers were kind of in a similar space where we were just like, oh, now you can read a book. Now you can have these conversations, huh? I didn't want people reading while we were watching on loop black people being murdered. I wanted people doing. And it, and it was frustrating because these were conversations we could have been having for so long. It's still, um, it's still painful. And I always have to remind myself that we ha you know, I have to meet the moment where it is, but damn, like it hurt. It was not, it was not, uh, it was not a celebration at all. Thank you for sharing that. So how do we take action when everything feels hopeless? I think it's important to recognize that people have been taking action. I wouldn't exist, there's not a, 
a black or native person in this room that would be here if we didn't come from a long line of action that has been happening underneath the noses of the masses for multiple generations. And so if you want to know what to do, look at what's being done. And every community is being done. And so if you don't know, that's a, that's a good sign that you need to start making some relationships and paying attention. Everyone wants to invent the wheel. Everyone wants to start a new thing. But the truth is, is that the networks that have been you know, providing reproductive care to people of color and disabled people who've been long denied it before any of these laws are passed are still in place doing better work than any of these things that just popped up in the last year ever could imagine. The truth is, is that right now everyone talking about what they're going to do about cops, we've been dealing with cops and getting our people out for generations. We have the networks built. What we don't have is money, right? What we don't have is the political pressure of the masses. And so finding that, look around, start Googling. There is, I have never been to, we do not suffer in silence. Like, understand that. I have never been to a place where those oppressed by systems of power suffer in silence. So, listen, and tap in. I guarantee you throughout Idaho, there are plenty of, um, especially native orcs, that have been doing work to get resources out to people, to talk about issues like violence against women, lack of funding and resources, violence in our schools. I guarantee you that even in Idaho, there are black groups that have been talking about police brutality, have been talking about education gaps, and showing up to do that work day in and day out. So find them, support them, ask, how can I be of use? And then, look at your own personal privilege and say, how has my privilege made this harder? And where can my privilege make this easier? And start leveraging it and asking other people to join you. Thank you. Um, what are some life moments that you've experienced that have brought you to hope that this work is possible or to know that this work is possible? Um, just being with people who are doing, who are doing the work you know, being with people who are building joy, like every day and building safe places for us to continue to exist and even thrive in oppressive and murderous systems. Like, I know it's possible, you know? I know it's possible because I saw, you know, in the protests and the uprising for black lives in 2020, I saw artist friends of mine turn their studios over as first aid stations for protesters. You know, I know it's possible because I have seen people who couldn't afford medical care be able to ask and have it delivered to them by people who had barely any more than them. I know it's possible because I'm here. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't possible. Like, I think it's important to understand that this government tried to exterminate us. It tried to grind us down. And I'm here, and so many other people I love are here. And so as long as we're here, amazing things are possible. Thank you. We're getting close to our time, and so I think this is going to be the final question. And um, I'm sure folks here are interested in hearing your answer to this one. How do you stay strong and hopeful in the face of such a daunting challenge? I think it's really important. This is something I was talking with um, an amazing lifelong dedicated activist, uh, Talia Lewis, TL, um, and they spend most of their time trying to get black, deaf, and disabled people out of incarceration and provide resources for those that they can't get out of incarceration. And they said, it's really important to know what your definition of success is in this work. 
and that it be something you can touch and feel every day. And it ties into something I've always tried to remind myself, which is that I do this work because Black Lives Matter. And this work will try to convince you in a white supremacist society that the individual doesn't matter. But at its, co at its core, white supremacy wants to deny our humanity. Right? It's a human problem at its core. It's looking at a person saying, you're not a person. You don't feel, you don't deserve to live and thrive. And if, if that's what it is at its core, then it means that even while our end goal is to take down these systems and put something more beautiful in its place, if we neglect to celebrate every life that can live and thrive, we are failing in our primary goal in refuting the white supremacist insistence that how we live doesn't matter. And so when you're doing this work, always take time to ground yourself in the humanity and the connections in what you're fighting for and not just what you're fighting against. And if you always remember what you're fighting for, and I am fighting for black joy, I am fighting for freedom, then everywhere I see it, I have to stop and appreciate it. Otherwise I get lost. And so always know what those smaller metrics of success are that you can turn to every day and that'll keep you going. Um, because if you keep thinking it's not successful until this system is destroyed, it's not successful until you know, this giant behemoth has been moved, um, you're gonna burn out and you're gonna forget why you were actually doing it. And we're doing this I am battling white supremacy, not because of white supremacy. I'm battling white supremacy because white supremacy threatens the people I love. Because I want us to live in joy. And that is one of the many systems that is in the way. And if I act like my end goal is white supremacy, then I'm just living in white supremacy. But if my end goal is joy and liberation, then I'm living in joy and liberation, even if I haven't defeated white supremacy yet. And, and that's kind of what I have to remember when I'm doing this work. Thank you so much for your generosity and sharing with us tonight. Thank you all so much. This concludes the keynote part of the event.